Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to get through this thing called life. Electric word, life. It means forever, and that's a mighty long time, but I'm here to tell you, there's something else. Final Ventures. Let's go crazy! Final peeps, we've got some fun in store for you. Well, maybe not fun. Maybe that's the wrong. We're trying to keep the energy up because this is going to be kind of a not a downer show, but we're not talking about we're not talking about fun vinyl. We're talking about people who are in the 27 club over or under. Yeah. So, and and a few other people that that probably died way too soon. Uh it's not necessarily fun but it's also a way to celebrate the music of those yeah i guess celebration yeah those better. people uh that weren't here that long but made a huge impact that's that's my spin on it yeah <laughs> that, that's a good spin because it's whenever you're talking about death and how some of these people in the music industry have died it's it's not pleasant it's not pleasant and there's kind of a through point and, yes <laughs> you know it's uh it, it it's one of those things that that seems like uh, it might be an anomaly when it happens to somebody, but then you start reading, you start researching, you realize that you know it happens to a lot. And the one that opened the door for me to kind of learn about the Twenty Seven Club was Kurt Cobain. Yeah, and I guess before Kurt, because the the big ones are you know all the artists who died in the in the late 60s early 70s and i think for a while it was kind of called the j club because they all had j's in their name <laughs> yeah yeah it, it but it, i remember when kurt died it was right before my 20th birthday and it was it, it was an odd time just a lot of things converging and uh then i started I, I realized he was 27. Most of these people, even when you're seeing them, even in real time, for some reason, I would have thought that he was older. Most of these people, I feel that way with. You, yeah. You look at Hendrix, you know, right before he died, he seemed a lot older. You look at Jim Morrison, he seemed twice that age. It's, yeah. It's just an interesting phenomena that has happened. And, you know, there are a lot of theories for why. It's so prevalent. Yeah. Uh, and we can kind of get into those as we go through. But we figured it would be nice to talk about and celebrate the music of these folks. And again, once you start picking through your collection, you're going to find a lot of uh, a lot of deceased artists. Yeah. And it may not be the the lead singer of, of the band or the the primary person in the band, but it's a member of the band, a, a popular band. Yeah. And when it happens, it's, it's huge. It's notable. I yeah. Mean, the most, the more recent one, he was 50, but the more recent one, Taylor Hawkins, I mean that, you know, that was huge. When, yeah. When, when he passed oh, away, yeah. I was actually driving here to this studio that morning and I heard it on, on the radio and I was like, what? I mean, yeah, it was kind of it was it was a shock for the world because it happened in South America. Yeah, in I Brazil mean, or if you know the story, it should yeah. really be a shock. Yeah, but it's always shocking when when someone of prominence like that passes away because a lot of it is, I, I mean, the lifestyle. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, the rock and roll lifestyle has a lot to do with these artists leaving the earth too soon. Mm -hmm. I mean. Yeah. drugs, alcohol, not to mention, I mean, being in a band may sound like the funnest thing in the world, but it is a brutal schedule. It's when like you're yeah. touring and the demands and the pressure. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like a marriage to the people that you're artists with. Yeah. And then on top of that, you have your personal life. You have your, your wife, your girlfriend, your kids, your, uh, you know, uh, things that you're financially responsible for. I mean, I think a lot of times people imagine these artists that that just live the way that they see them, but they also have lives. Yeah. And 
I think of the, the chaotic times in my life, you know, and there have been plenty of them, you know, most of them at my own hand. But, you know, trying to balance everything, and, and I don't even have kids. Yeah. I mean, it, trying to balance everything is, uh, it's difficult. And, and I respect that. Yeah. And we, we never talk about the mental health a- aspect of rock and roll and music and what it means. But that's a big play because you think of it, you put out a record and it's a hit record. And then your next one doesn't do so well that's going to affect you mentally. Yeah. That's, and you're going to internalize it because it's it's you. So you think, oh, I'm just worthless. I'm no good. Yeah. I had one thing. Yeah. I mean, they do say that you have your whole life to write your first record. Yeah. You know, and, and we have been lucky to be alive at a time when we have seen so many people uh, create these albums and and these songs and at the same time had the opportunity to see them live that's the other thing i think people forget about a lot of time our generation uh has gotten to see some of the greatest yeah rock and pop artists of all time and now we're at an age where those folks are passing away yeah you know, and the, the, the ones who didn't die at 27 yeah. and the the amazing thing is Keith Richards is still alive. <laughs> I mean, he's he's still. drank too much. He smoked too much. He was a heroin addict. Yeah, <laughs> come yeah. on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he he is an anomaly. Yeah. But um, and I guess I just a little side note. I guess his uh, biography is really good. Yeah. But um, there's some interesting viewpoints in there, and I think since he wrote that, he's quit drinking and smoking. Well. He's 70, oh. 70 plus. Oh, he's like 80. I think 80. Yeah. yeah. So he should. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, he's at a time when he should be slowing down. Come on, take it easy. <laughs> so we aren't necessarily talking about the most famous people in these groups or like we will said, the, the singer. But there are people in bands, guitarists, maybe ancillary folks who are a major part of those bands. And they may not be the person that anyone could go name off the street, but it, it's still a major uh, thing when these folks pass away. So what's the uh, first artist you want to celebrate? Well, the first one. I'll take the Vinyl Ventures record down. We mentioned Kurt Cobain. Yeah. And... Uh, Someone he dated before he dated Courtney Love is uh, Kristen Plaff. She's bassist. Bassist. That's what I thought. It was yeah. a bass. She was the bassist for Hole, and she was part of that whole Seattle grunge scene. Mm-hmm. I mean, she was well known in that scene. She she actually passed away uh, like a month after after uh, Kurt, right? Yeah. Or a few months after. Yeah, a few months after. He he died in April. She died in June. Yeah. And she was just barely 27. Yeah. And how did... Oh, she took her own life, didn't she? Yeah. And I mean, that's that's one of the... That's one of the throughputs of, of this show. A lot of these artists have either committed suicide or through drugs or alcohol yeah have yep wound up on the other side yep and you know we could sit here and list all of them off uh there's a lot of them she so that was in 94 was that before live through this came out that is a very good question if if you can it must have been yeah she must have uh Nope, she's on this album. Yeah, I thought she was in on that album. Yep. Played bass, piano, and backing vocals. It's interesting when you separate, like, the Seattle group in this, uh, in, in this discussion. Because that, that is kind of the most fresh for all of us, whether you were into the Seattle scene or not. If you go back and you do an inventory, there's a lot of folks. There's a lot of uh, 
folks who have not survived from that scene. Well, and I don't know if it was, and maybe this was a more of a regional problem in Seattle, but heroin was still in the, in the late eighties and early nineties was a big issue in the Seattle area. Yeah. And so a lot of those folks hopped on that train. Yeah. I mean, it's a beautiful part of the country, but I feel like when I've been there, there's, there's a heaviness to yeah. the Northwest to Seattle and, you know, and Oregon. And, and when I, when I've gone there, you, you can't pinpoint it, but you can, you can kind of feel it. And if you just think back to that early nineties, late eighties time, I mean, the, really the most famous artist that had come from Seattle up until that time was Jimi Hendrix. Yes. Which is another like tie in. Yeah. But, um, there's, it just seems like there's a heaviness and I don't know exactly what that is, but it certainly came out in the music. Absolutely. And you hear people say, well, you know, it rains. It does not rain all the time in Seattle. No. I mean, actually, Seattle has more days of sunshine than Indianapolis. Interesting. Hmm. Which is crazy. Yeah. I mean, if you really think about yeah. it. It's it's very much known for being like the rainy city. Yeah. yeah. In the times that I've been there, it hasn't. Thank goodness. Yeah. And I mean, if it does rain in Seattle, it rarely rains in Seattle all day. It may rain in the morning or in the afternoon, but it's not, I, I mean, you've heard that term, a Seattle rain. Yeah. Where it's just a mist. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and Kind of like we've had this morning. Yeah. Which, <laughs> you know, a rainy day can be kind of. Depressing. Depressing. Mm -hmm. For sure. And if your mental state is a little shaky. it. Yeah. And it's true when you think about it, if it's sunny out, even if it's cold, it, it's, it, it is more of a mood lifter. Yeah than you know just cloudy skies and warm weather so and for th those of you who love rain sorry <laughs> it's just not our back <laughs> i most of the time if if i'm blaming it on anything i'm blaming it on the rain because i listened to millie vanilli um that's a good one yeah r.i.p Kristen. Kristen. so <clears throat> clearing the throat. My first one that I'm going to talk about is Xander, Dave Alexander from the Stooges. And he is actually a member of the 27 Club. He was uh, born on June 3rd, 1947 and passed away in 1975, February of 1975. Uh, he was the original bassist for the Stooges and uh, he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with the band in 2010. He actually died of a pulmonary edema in 1975 in Ann Arbor, Michigan, after being admitted to a hospital for pancreatitis, which was actually linked to his alcoholism. Yeah. So um, during the Stooges' induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2010, Iggy paid tribute to Alexander during his speech. So you, you listen to these Stooges records and there is a rawness and an aggressiveness that I, I, I'm not sure anybody before or since captured because these, you know, love them or hate them. There, there is just an energy, especially these first two records. And you, you take that in and internalize it. And, you know, if you go to shows and see bands, I mean, you feel that energy coming from them. Imagine yeah. them living that life, putting that energy out there time, you know, night after night on tour. And uh, I think this is a good example of, you know, living fast and hard for sure. Yeah, and the the Stooges were not making, uh, they're well known now, but at the time they were not making a ton of money. I know that when the Stooges finally fell apart, I think Iggy moved back home and lived in his parents' trailer. No kidding. Huh. I've seen a documentary on, they were, it, it was just a, it was a crazy time. And the, everybody in the band was abusing a lot of different substances and alcohol. So they were yeah. living the rock and roll lifestyle. Right. And it's interesting. It, it's always interesting to me 
to think, okay, were these people like this before they became famous? I mean, they're from, you know, Michigan. They're from Detroit area. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I'm sure that um, a lot of people from that area knew them as they were coming up. But yeah. it's just, it, it's an interesting thing to consider whether or not the the music industry kind of turned them this way or if they were that way all along. Yeah, and, and you know, Michigan is is one of those places that has, it's one of those areas that a lot of great music artists have come from. So it's it's a very working class and blue collar, blue collar. And I think it just, you know, people did not come from extravagant means. Right. So they're trying to find ways out of out of the system. Right. That's a that's a great point. Um, I just I love these both oh, of these yeah. Stooges records. The Stooges. I, mean, I, I like all the first three. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. They're just, it's, it's to think that they came out when they did in the early seventies. Yeah. It's just kind of, where did this come from? (laughs) Yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure had I been alive at the time, they would have scared the hell out of me much in the same way that Black Sabbath would have scared the hell out of me. And it's two different sides of the same coin. I mean, they are more in the punk vein. I, I, I don't think you listen to it now and you go punk. But at the time, that sound had really never been made. No. And, you know, so they kind of got rolled into the punk scene, even though they predated it. But, you know, like five, six, seven years. Yeah. Um, But I just, I love it. It, It's so great. MC5 is the same. Yeah, MC5. Also from Detroit. And there is that energy there, too. They they predated the Stooges. They were more, um, you know, social commentators and right. and kind of on that edge i everybody's got their every, everybody's got their muse the thing that makes them do what they do right and we just lost R- wayne kramer from mc5 and by the way they still haven't been inducted in the rock and roll hall of fame and and that's that that's, needs to happen that's a miss they may not have sold a million you know 10 million records but they they influenced bands like this. Yeah, they were big influencers. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, I I love the Stooges. I was never really an Iggy Pop guy. But, like, the the first time I heard the Stooges, I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm I get it. I'm all in. <laughs> so, R.I.P. Xander. That is... Bassist from the Stooges. A couple of bassists to start the show. Yeah. Starting out on the low end. Yeah. What's well, not the low end. The bases are always ignored. The low end of the register. Yes. That's okay. What, that's what I mean. The foundation. <laughs> the ones that hold the found- it together. You yeah. Know, the, the, the pocket. Found- the foundation. I there like that. Yeah. We start with the foundation. We're building the house up. Yeah. And then we'll knock it down with sadness. Yes. What's your next one? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go to the top floor. The Minutemen, D Boone. Yeah. So D Boone. Now, unlike our setup, D. Boone tragically died in an auto accident. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was the lead singer for the Minutemen. And this is double nickels on the dime, but we're not going to talk just about this album. We're talking about D. Boone. This is like one of your favorites, right? I love this album. Yeah. Yeah. And this was like their, I want to say their third. Third or fourth. Yeah. Yeah. I need to get some Minutemen, man. And the, they were, they hit the uh, the eighties music scene, the the new wave kind of when it took off. Yeah. And they were, they infused jazz and funk. It was a really different sound. I I've never heard anybody else duplicate that sound. Maybe uh, maybe what Rage Against the Machine, yeah, did yeah. is. I mean, Rage definitely took it to a different level. Yeah. But yeah, that's a, that's a good description. Um, where were they from? They were from... They were from L.A. L.A. Yeah. And, uh, well, actually, well, he was from, he was born on April 1st, 1958 in San Pedro, California. Okay. And they formed the Minutemen with uh, Mike Watt and George Hurley, mm-hmm. and they're... They would do politically charged songs. Yeah. I much, mean, much in the same way like MC5 or X. MC5, yeah. 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 
And uh, so it wasn't just like punk rock for the sake of punk rock. There was a there was a driving force and a message behind a lot of it. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. Yep. And his let's see, he was he was in a van in the Arizona desert on Interstate 10. Mm. And the van, it was a desolate stretch of road. And he just, we're not exactly sure what happened, but the van crashed and D Boone uh, died. What year was that? That was in, on December 22nd, 1985. Man, what a short. Oh, the van's axle broke. Ugh. And the van ran off the road. And this was probably a time when people weren't wearing seatbelts. As because my, yeah, for sure. He was thrown from the van, broke his neck, and died. Oh, damn. And he is actually one of the members. He's a of 27, the yeah. 27 club member. Uh, it's, it's, it's crazy. Uh, we were talking with Keith before the show, uh, and he was talking about reading a story about, you know, when people are at their, their creative height, and a lot of folks think it's at around that age, but then you also think of all the other stuff that gets churned into your life, it, not just creatively, but your life, your kids, people are starting to get married. Supposedly your brain is, is almost still, yeah, like almost fully formed, but still developing. And so it's, it's a theory that that's why that happens so much. And if I can find that story or, or something that links to it or relates to it all, I'll, I'll do that and share it. But I can't think, I, I mean, I think about when I was 27. Yeah, I was a basket case too, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I didn't have um, the pressures and, and the, the kind of talent that these folks had to try and, and, you know, balance it all. And these guys, I mean, these guys were never as big as it no. seems like they should have been. Right. And I mean, and a lot of these bands... You know they were they were on their swing up. Mm -hmm. Of course, at twenty seven, you know, if you start a band in your early twenties, mm -hmm. you're on your swing up. Yeah, yeah. It it, it it's a shame. I mean, it, in talking about this before the show, uh, Wheels and Jacob and I were were talking about the day the music died, and I think a lot of people forget that Buddy Holly w was in a club all his own. He was twenty two. When he died, twenty-two. Richie Valens was seventeen. Seventeen. When that happened, I mean, and, uh, find anybody who knows anything about music, and they know about Richie Valens. Oh at, yeah, it's seventeen. He burst onto the music scene, and then he was gone. Yeah, you know, uh, it, it's it's crazy to think that Buddy Holly was that young. Yeah. When, when he died, I don't think of him being twenty-two. Yeah. Yes. I, that's just mesmerizing because yeah. everybody knows that name and to think he left the planet at 22. Yeah. I mean, just imagine the, 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 um, what was left, right. The, the amount of talent that guy yeah. did being the groundbreaking guy that he was. I mean, it was 1959 when these guys died. This predates the, the Beatles becoming, you know, worldwide, uh, Stars. I mean, Buddy Holly was the guy. I mean, you had Elvis, Little Richard, Buddy Holly, Bill Haley. You know, those those guys were kind of like the foundation of rock and roll. And uh, I remember seeing the Buddy Holly story when I was very young, which is a great movie and one of the best performances ever. I, I, it's Gary Busey. He's yeah. A little, he's a little off the reservation now. But. Yeah. But uh, yeah, to think he played Buddy Holly, it doesn't even kind of resonate yeah, with you. Yeah. But it's such a great movie. So if you get a chance, you should watch that. But this is a, this is a great example. It's, it's such a shame too. Uh, SST records too, right? Yes. Yeah. Pretty cool. Um, I love the fact that, that this is a gatefold. Yeah, and you've got tons of uh, who was a a known artist for uh, SST Raymond Pettibone. All these weird little that like the I love the crazy hippie thing. <laughs> if you can read, I can't read that. I'll wait, let's see if I can. I doubt I can. No, that drum. Wait a minute. Let's see. That drum solo sounds so far freaking out. 
I want to take it with me. And <laughs> it's, it's a guy jumping off a roof. Yeah, it's a because part of the punk scene was this hatred toward hippies. Yeah, hatred toward hippies. <laughs> Not so much disco, which is weird, but right. it was hippies. Yeah, yeah, that's so funny. <laughs> well, that's a good one, man. And and it every time we talk about those guys, I'm like, you need to get some Minutemen. And I still haven't. Yeah, this is the one to get. If you're getting a Minutemen album, this pretty much is the okay. magna opus. Cool. Well, what I have is ugh, my favorite era of ACDC is Bon Scott. I think you listen to their music and they are very much like a punk band. I mean, you've, you've got like blues infused punk and rock. Um, and then a guy with a voice like, like Bonds. And I, I go back and forth between my favorite Bond ACDC record. I love Powerage. I mean, you, this, this record is just beginning to end is almost rock and roll perfection. And then Dirty Deeds is another favorite. And Highway to Hell is just a great record too. But Bond, not a member of the 27 club, but he was, he was born, uh, nine July, 1946 in Scotland. And he passed away, uh, February 19th, 1980. And he was 33 years old. He, he lived hard. And, um, on, on the 15th of February, he attended a session where he and Angus and Malcolm, we're working on the beginnings of two songs that would later be recorded for Back in Black, Have a Drink on Me and Let Me Put My Love Into You. And um, he kind of went out and was on a, uh, on a bit of a binge. He passed out and uh, instead of, I, I, I think the story is that he, his friend lived upstairs and he had his car downstairs and as opposed to having to walk up the stairs because he was so drunk, he just got in the car and slept. And then that's, that's when he passed away, which is a terrible ending to an incredible artist's yeah. life. Um, but yeah, uh, 33 is still super, super young. But when you think about the impact that ACDC has had, and, and maybe next to the Stones, they could be the biggest band in the world, yeah. you know, right now. Um, the, the impact that he had in that short amount of time, you know, has, has not been forgotten no. by, by anybody. And, and, you know, the person that, that pays him the most respect most of the time is Brian Johnson, and he's the guy that replaced him yeah. in ACDC. Um, also another dude with an amazing voice, but he's at the other end of that where he was taking over for a guy like this. He tried out for the band. They like, like I just mentioned, they had a couple ideas already for that record. And he, you know, he got asked to go to, I think it was in Jamaica or no, it might've been the Bahamas where they were recording back in black and recorded all this stuff. And, and, he has said multiple times that when he got done, he's like, there is no way this is ever going to go over. And it became the biggest album of their career. That's, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. To be up against those odds, to be replacing somebody like Bond, to have to live up to that and to record an album that is whatever it is, like four or five times diamond. Uh, it, it's an amazing story, but I, you know, in, in appreciating that story, I, I don't want to forget about Bond because it, none of that would have happened without him. It's it's crazy. I mean, we talked about the Australian show. Yeah. And I've gotten a lot of comments from people since we put that show out that, you know, oh, man, I didn't realize. Or, you know, there's there's it's so far away and there's so much American pop music or music that's been popular here that is made by Australian people. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. So ACDC is definitely at the top of that list. And like I said, Powerage one day, um, you know, if you want blood, you've got it. That's a live record. Oh yeah. Oh, that's a great live record. That's one. It's like in your face. It's so good. Yeah. These guys are great. I love the picture of them on the back there too. Oh yeah. Yeah. Getting ready to set the world on fire. RIP Bon Scott. Next, another not member 
of uh, the 27 Club. Ian Curtis, Joy Division. Joy Division. Unknown Pleasures. Unknown Pleasures. This was the shirt Jay got me, so I brought Closer. The uh, they, they only had two albums. Yeah. So uh, Unknown Pleasures and then Closer. And uh, they were... Ian Curtis was the lead singer of the band, and he was only, well, what did I say? He was only, what, 23 when he died. And uh, Ian was, he was the typical troubled music star. I mean, he had... He had he struggled with depression and he had attempted suicide and this last time unfortunately he Succeeded. was successful. Yeah. Yeah, that's But he also had epilepsy which was an issue at times, but especially back then when when there probably were very few uh things to treat that. Yeah. And that could have made the depression even even worse yeah yeah and they were about to embark on their north american tour and and kind of break over here yeah and he he had a big fear of flying oh i mean and that kind of goes anxiety that goes along with depression mm -hmm. it's kind of the they're kind of wrapped into one thing yeah if you're really depressed you have a lot of anxiety oh yeah and uh so he was he had an intense fear of flying and his he was about to go through a divorce his wife was going to serve oh man he was the 23 paper. Huh? yeah oh and i mean it, they, they were very working class manchester it's you know a lot like detroit mm -hmm. manchester was a working class city yeah and he just decided this is it. Isn't it crazy a band like that with just two records uh, who really hadn't ever broken in the U.S. that isn't it kind of crazy to think how how much they mean to you and you you hear about so many people that that love this band. It's it, it's amazing, really. Yeah. What it, would have happened if if he had survived? I mean, they, yeah. they would they may have become the next you too. Yeah, and I think with with uh, the, the three surviving members forming New Order and continuing on, I think that that kind of helped perpetuate the legend of Joy Division yeah. and where they were and yeah. the music they were making. And that's not always the the thing that happens. I mean, a lot of times this this type of thing destroys groups, but you know, New Order rose from the ashes of of this band and and. That's the silver lining for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it, I mean, when you're talking about death, there's, there's not, it, it's hard to go in many different directions, but he had a lot of, he had a lot of stuff going on, which it's to say it's not surprising, but there were people that were genuinely worried about his mental health mm -hmm. as he was coming up. Yeah. I mean, people would check on him all the time. Yeah, that's it's a tale as old as time. Yes, as as long as we've had entertainers and you know artists and poets, and there's there yeah. have, there have been you know untimely departures. Yeah, and we think I think we uh, I think we think of musicians less of artists as more of entertainers, but they're really artists. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you think about all the troubled. Artists you've heard yeah. in this world, like, you know, uh, Van Gogh, yeah. the guy chopped off his ear. Yeah. It's so strange when you think about, you know, a lot of people may not think of pop music or rock music as art or as uh, of the people that make it are artists, but they really are. I mean, yeah. it, it, they may not be sculpting, they may not be painting. But, you know, the, the folks who are the best in all of those things are usually the tortured souls. Yes. And that that's a through point, no matter what the art is, that is just, it, at least it seems like that's the way it is. And it definitely goes to that 
aspect of mental health. Right. Yeah. Right. Which I feel like our society uh, is just starting to uh, be honest with itself about mental health. And I think, you know, if there's one thing, one good thing that came from COVID, it is that awareness of the, the um, necessity of good mental health yeah. or having mental, having help available. Yes. Um, you know, there's what I, I think it's, it's, it's not presented itself yet, but I'm sure that there are artists who are going to blossom from that COVID era. Those kids like my middle nephew who, you know, the last part of his high school career was spent in the middle of COVID. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm sure in the future there will be artists who have sprung from that and, uh, that we'll, we'll get to see the art that they share from, from those experiences too. So I need a You're hug. You're next. I need a hug. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm always down for a hug for sure. So this one we have talked about before. Um, this is T-Rex, Tyrannosaurus Rex, Mark Bolin, you know, the guy that David Bowie looked up to. And this is Electric Warrior. This is the, the Abbey Road Half Speed Master version of it. And if you haven't heard this, just buy it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's it's so great. There is there is a there is a swagger to his music. There is a groove. There's like that that blues rock built in with the glammy um, David Bowie feeling, Mott the Hoople type. I mean, all of it it exists right here within this one guy. And you know. W- we I don't think we've ever talked about this, but really the the whole all the glam stuff holds up pretty well. It doesn't sound dated. Yeah, it really. Like you know, all the early '60s Beatles, Stones, mm-hmm. any of that stuff seems a little dated, and even some later '60s stuff. Yeah, it seems. I mean, it's okay to like it, but the glam stuff. Yeah, really doesn't sound dated. It sounds like something that could come out. Yeah. I feel like part of that is because it is just like on the edge of pop. You know what I mean? Yeah. It it kind of feels just on the edge of like dance type music. Kind of the way the Clash walked that yeah. tightrope between rock and and R&B and dance. And you're right. I mean, it does hold up. Mark Bolin, uh born September 30, 1947, and he died September 16th, 1977. So he was 29 years old when he died, so just past that uh, 27 club. Uh, he died in a car crash, and, you know, it, that, that's also when you, 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 you have overdoses, you have suicides, you have car crashes, you know. Yeah, you just it's, don't have these young artists dying of like natural causes. Right, right, right. Um, so it, this this dude started a thing and didn't know he was starting a thing, and it just got picked up by people like Dave Bo- David Dave Bo. <laughs> Dave, what is good with old, what is with me Dave. calling these people? Hey, Dave, come Dave. here. I want to talk to you about you calling yourself David. <laughs> So, you know, when someone like Bowie is a huge fan of what you're doing, you're probably doing the right thing. And, uh, you know, this this has just got Jeepster, uh, Lean Woman Blues, Get It On, which is really, unfortunately, that's the only uh, song that most people in the U.S. know yeah. by T-Rex. But they've a lot of people have heard of T-Rex. Yeah. He is almost like a mythic character oh yeah you know dying that young having that much influence being that talented it's you will take on a you will take on a kind of a mythical uh existence oh without a doubt i mean that comes with that comes with the territory dying young before you've really hit your peak yeah yeah so if you get a chance this uh gosh i probably got this two years ago 
um, and it it will fluctuate. This this yeah. is one of the ones that does fluctuate in price. So keep keep an eye out for it. But I th- I probably got it for twenty four or twenty five bucks, and I felt good about it. It sounds fantastic. These Abbey Road uh, remasters, whether it's oh, they're really whether good. it's Pink Floyd or the Beatles stuff or this, they are so good. You know, those folks at Abbey Road seem to know what they're doing when it comes they, to music. They, they've got the game. They've got the game set. Hey, <laughs> do you think? Uh, you think uh, Dave and Mike are hanging out up in the big sky? Dave and Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need to do like a painting on velvet Yeah, of Dave Bowie and Mike Jackson just hanging out, yeah. talking shop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've been waiting to say that for like five yes, minutes, right? I have. <laughs> <laughs> what's, uh, what's your next... Tribute. R.I.P. Mark Bolin, by the way. Next. The Grateful Dead. This was the, uh, not the last studio album Pigpen was on, Mm -hmm. but Pigpen is part Ron Pigpen McKernan. Yep. From the Grateful Dead. He he is part of the 27 Club. Yep. And he, he, very influential for the dead. Oh, yeah. Um, Yeah. And... This is this is going back because he was born at the kind of the end of World War II, September eighth, nineteen forty five, and departed March eighth, nineteen seventy three. He was a founding. He was the second guitarist along with Bob Weir, and mm-hmm. I think after after he died, Bob started to pick up on a lot of the stuff that Pigpen, Pigpen was, was doing. doing. Yeah. I mean, I, and you. One of their the Dead's most legendary tours was 72. 72 Europe was supposed to be, that's like one of the gold standards. That's cool. And uh, he was, I mean, there were, there were guys and the Dead were doing a lot of different things with guitars mm-hmm. and making different sounds and their whole wall of sound. I, I mean, we, we think of, you know the dead being the hippies and all these people going to shows but they they really opened up what what music could be Mm -hmm. and the sound more than anything yeah if you look at these early pictures of the dead live they've got these massive speaker stands Mm -hmm. yeah i mean it's funny we we never talk about the dead and between the jj show and now I think we've met, they've been mentioned twice. So it's good. It's yeah. good to bring that in. It's good to bring the, the dead in. Um, you know, there. It, it's interesting. Once Jerry died, the dead was dead for about like two or three years, I think. And then uh, dead and company. And then all of the remaining guys have their uh, kind of offshoot of the band. But... I think it's really interesting to see a band like this, maybe like no other band, is possibly celebrated more now than they were back then. It, it's not the same, you know, kind of shows, and, and obviously most of the fans are older, older. now. But the people have held on to this and yeah. run with it. And the, and the other great thing about a band like this, when you're talking about a founding member or an early member passing away, they, there are live shows, there are performances recorded, you know, hundreds and hundreds of them. So he's, you know, he, he lives on in those recordings. Oh yeah. There aren't a lot of bands from that era that have that type of recording back catalog of live shows. So you know, if there's a silver lining there, that's it. Yeah. He'll be remembered forever. Yeah. And, you know, Rhino is their label. It's a Warner offshoot, but they, uh, you know, they, they release almost, almost every year on record store day, they release a new, uh, dead live album or, you know, something. So that's, that's great. That's a legacy that, that keeps building. They are, it's not just like, 10 records that they keep re-releasing. I mean, they live show after live show are, are available out there. And that's, that's awesome. Yeah. And pig pins, alcohol and drug abuse did him in, I think his, uh, 
His final concert was in 72 at the Hollywood Bowl Hmm. in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And uh, he kind of broke off. He broke off relationships with the band. It's it's not like he left the band. He just kind of had f- gone on a extended bender. Yeah, yeah. Which you hear about a lot of dudes doing yeah. that type of thing. He was found dead in seventy three, March eighth of seventy three, uh, of a gastrointestinal hemorrhage in his home in California uh. by his landlady. At uh, at his funeral, Garcia spoke and said, after Pigpen's death, we all knew it was the end of the original Grateful Dead. Yeah. Yeah. And I I was just thinking when you were talking about this, how hard it must be to go through the ringer like these bands do to get to that place where their, you know, their creativity is on display and they are a known band with, you know, records and a live following. And then one day, one of those dudes that was there from the beginning, or at least from close to the beginning, is not around anymore. How, yeah. how much of a transition that must be. And you're talking about, in the entertainment industry, a lot of people leaning on those drugs and the alcohol and stuff. So, you know, you can probably assume that there was self-medicating going on. Oh, yeah. Around that person just to try and get through that experience. So I think I think we minimize a lot of the time how um, easy we might think that it is to be a rock star or a pop star. Um, But, you know, there's a lot to deal with. Yeah, we say we say, oh, they're just partying in heaven. No, they're self medicating to get through life. Yeah. And the self medicating just gets out of hand. Yeah. Well, that's that's a great one. I'm I'm glad that you uh Yeah, and this is American Beauty and I mean he was he was part of Working Man's Dead and American Beauty, which both came out in seventy, which are pretty much the Grateful Dead's gold standard. Yeah, for sure. So the Napster thing happened, you know, whenever early 2000s around there. And um, these guys were allowing people to just bootleg. Bootleg all you want. All you want. So it, it, that was in like direct defiance of the record company. Yeah. And they'd been doing that for a long time. Yeah. At that point, a decade. Yeah. And I can't name... I can't think of any more off the top of my head. There were other bands that allowed that. Yeah, but, but they not that many. Yeah, and the Dead would allow. They had a whole like corral where you could set up. You could bring a, you know, an eight track recorder, <laughs> and eight mics, and record the show, and they were a okay with it. Yeah, it's just a totally different mindset. It really is. Yeah. When you think about it. Well, that's a good one, man. Yeah. Awesome. R.I.P. Pigpen. I was just thinking about um, Dwayne Allman. He he was 24 when, when he died in the motorcycle accident. Oh, yeah. And you think, and he played on a, in Muscle Shoals at the, uh, at the recording studio down there. He played a lot on a lot of songs that he's not credited for. But again, you you look at the reverence that people that people have for him you know eric clapton asked him to be part of Derek and the dominoes and um then you think about not only was he a member of the allman brothers band but he was an allman brother yeah and greg allman had to pick up those pieces along with the rest of the band and keep going and how hard that would be Oh, you know, yeah. Uh, it, with all the other pressures coming in. Oh, absolutely. And uh, I just I just wanted to throw his name out there because, you know, we've we've talked about them uh, a few times. One person, obviously not a member of the 27 Club, but definitely gone too early is Michael Jackson. He was 50 when he passed away. And that was in 
2009. We've talked about the Jacksons and Michael a lot. And I think he deserves to be talked about because I think even though he's the, the, the best selling artist out there, I think his talent is kind of downplayed. And he had a lot of good people around him. Quincy Jones producing stuff, you know, basically the entire Toto band playing on Thriller. You know, he had great musicians and, and had the means to have all of the great musicians. But that just tells you that, you know, you put those great things together, great things can happen. And I, I, I think in, in the flurry of all of the, the uh, tabloid type stuff that came out about Michael, his talent got lost. You know, it, yeah. it's, 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 that is the headline. Oh, by the way, he's sold like 105 million copies of whatever. But this is an interesting collection. It's called Scream, and it it has uh, This Place Hotel, Thriller, Blood on the Dance Floor, Somebody's Watching Me, which is actually uh, Rockwell yeah, with Michael Jackson singing back up on it. Rockwell is um, Barry Gordy's son, in case you guys didn't know that. Dirty Diana, Torture, Leave Me Alone, Scream, Dangerous, Escape. I mean, th- it's it's a collection that's supposed to be kind of like spooky, spooky yeah. type stuff. Darker. Yeah. This this got real cheap um, a couple of years ago, and I'm like, sure, why not? So Michael is uh, is definitely not forgotten. I, w- I was just listening to a, an interview with the guitarist Orianti, uh, really talented. Uh, female guitarist she's the one that was playing on that this is it tour with him and rehearsing with him so that footage that you see of Michael rehearsing like right before he died with the guitarist on stage that's Orianti and uh, it seems like there's no matter what I'm listening to Michael's name comes up a lot and I think that that also speaks to just he wasn't just a dance music guy he wasn't just an r&b guy he crossed over into the rock world you know with beat it and all of that stuff so um it's i'm i'm reminded a lot being as as much of a music fan as i am of michael and his influence yeah and have you seen the documentary we are the world i have not watched that yet it's i have a lot more respect for mike i'm gonna say mike (laughs) I we I have a lot more respect for Mike after watching that because it's you you see him working with a cadre of musicians uh-huh. and just really really getting involved. Mm-hmm. I mean, and you're less less—he's less of a performer and more of a, like a organizer. Almost. Organizer, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is funny because all you hear is about is how timid he was and kind of quiet and kind of an introvert. Yeah. Uh, I, I've seen footage from that and seen that kind of thing. I, I really want to yeah, watch that. The, I cannot recommend that thing enough. And I, and I have a lot more respect for Lionel Richie, somebody oh, yeah. I've not really been... Exposed to. Yeah, yeah. Not really like that much, but it's like after seeing that, it's like, wow, I... I need some Lionel Richie. I don't even know why. Stevie Wonder was a big Stevie part of that Wonder, too. yeah. Yeah. Um it's it's interesting also the there was a documentary released last year called uh Thriller Forty. So for the fortieth anniversary of Thriller. And that's I haven't watched it yet, but I've I've heard th- nothing but good things about the making of that record. Yeah. And what it took to do that. So yeah, you should check it out. Michael. Still giving to us music fans. All right. So now we're going to move on to the uh, kind of the artists that were the impetus for the for the 27 Club. Yeah, we got a couple of those sprinkled in here. What's your first one? And it was called the J Club for a while because a lot of them had J's in their names. So really? we'll start with the JJ okay. Janice Joplin. Yep. Oh, oh, I forgot it was a gatefold. 
Big Brother and the Holding Company, Cheap Thrills. And I didn't have a lot of Janis Joplin in my collection. I don't. I have none. And uh, I picked this up, and I really, really like it. She's another one, man, just like that energy released, you know, just explosion of energy. And to be a female artist fronting a rock band at that time and to break out doing that, obviously she was a talent like nobody would seen before. Yeah, and Janice, of course, 27. So she uh, she was born in 43 and departed in, you know, I could do math. She departed in uh, 1970, mm-hmm. October 4th. Yeah. And 1970 was not a not a good year for uh, some legendary artists leaving this planet. And uh, she uh, died of a heroin overdose in 1970. And uh, she released three albums, two with Big Brother and the Holding Company and one solo album. Pearl. Pearl mm-hmm. was her second solo album, re- was released posthumously mm-hmm. in 1971. Yeah. Kind of crazy. Yeah. To think that, and that's the one, oh, yeah, everybody knows they think of the Pearl, mm-hmm. but not a lot of work. No. But well known. Not much of a catalog. That's no. kind of like what I was saying when we started the show. Um, there are artists who left a lot of music, and there are artists who have not. And yeah. obviously, the 27 Club has a shorter time frame in which to create that music and and leave it behind and uh i guess rolling stone ranked janice as the as number 46 in its 100 greatest artists of all time that's yeah i mean that's probably pretty low yeah i mean a lot of things go into um someone's popularity someone's fame um you just listen to her sing and you're like, wow. Yeah. I even, mean, even today. You you still have a lot of people say, oh, she has a very Janis Joplin voice. Yeah. Yeah. Almost all female like yeah. rock or soul singers. They want to go to that that sound. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably not going to be repeated. There's, no. there's been a few. Yeah. That have been really good. Uh, Joss Stone is, is one of my uh, favorite female singer she's great there's there's so many of them out there but there's none of them like like janice was and you know not only did she have the fame and fortune but i think she was also gay at a time when uh it wasn't accepted that was certainly taboo that's a cool gatefold the front cover is a crumb is a bunch of uh, is that our crumb? Yeah, it's a oh, bunch of our wow. crumb. Okay, little cartoons. Yeah, that's cool. And uh, yeah, this is a it, it's a good one to hear. Yeah. It's a really good. It's I don't know why I didn't know it was a live album. Maybe because she just wasn't on my big radar. Yeah, there she is. That's a great picture too. She has a a great smile. I mean, there are so many photos of her, and she's always happy and smiling. Yeah, yeah. Maybe maybe that was just an act, John. It could have just been an act. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good one. It it just goes ahead and reminds me that I need to get some Janice, Janice Joplin. Cool, man. I like it. Janice, what well, you got? Well, we're going to stick with the Jays of the 27 Club. I brought my uh, gold record uh, version of the Doors first album. And obviously we're talking about Jim Morrison. The older I get, the more a fan of the of the doors i am because man there there are very few bands i mean the beatles you know the beatles when you hear them whether somebody's singing or not yeah somehow you know them you also know the doors like you the keyboards and just the the different rhythms and and things that they infused into it the Robbie Krieger and John Dinsmore I mean those Raymond Zarek that they they are a distinctive band like anytime you see a movie that's set in the six in the 60s there's almost without fail a door song yeah and I think that speaks to 
how important they were at the time that they were. You know what I mean? Because they were so far ahead of their time. They're kind of a progressive rock band before that was even a thing. Yeah, you that's know? a good point. Yeah. And and he was, at least has always been portrayed as like the tortured artist and poet and, you know, the guy that was afraid to face the the crowd at their early performances. And um, I, I, I just love The Doors. And when I think of that 27 club, I mean, he's he's kind of like the poster boy yeah. for it. Which, did you bring the same Doors record? No, no. I brought... Oh, yes. Because this was Jim's last album with the band. Yeah, L.A. Woman. L.A. Woman. And he, uh, he had announced that he was going to Paris to just take some time mm-hmm. with his girlfriend. Yeah. And the rest of the band thought, that's probably a pretty good idea. Yeah. In retrospect. Yeah, in Maybe retrospect. Not. No, I, I love L.A. Woman too it's crazy they kind of became more of a blues based blues infused rock band as as they went on yeah they really did and it's so great i mean uh roadhouse blues one of the best i mean maybe one of the best door songs but one of the best rock songs rock blues songs has such a great groove you know all all of the parts, all of the uh, guys and their instruments are just perfectly f- uh, kind of featured in that song. It's 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 such a good album. And and Jim was definitely the the wild card of the band. I mean, because the other three were very good, tight musicians. Yeah. And they just kind of let Jim do his own thing. <laughs> yeah. I love, I love. Uh, when in the in the movie that Val Kilmer was in, which he that performance is fantastic. Oh yeah, that's in in my opinion, that's probably Val's best performance because he became Jim Morrison. He did the like the live performance parts of those movies. That's Val Kilmer singing. Yeah, it's not Jim Morrison. Yeah, he really became Jim Morrison, and he even looked like him. I mean, oh yeah, you, you think back and it's like, wait a minute. That's Val. No, yeah. that's Jim. But in that movie, when they're kind of first coming together, and I think it's uh, uh, Robbie Krieger had come up, had written "Light My Fire," uh, you know the the guitar part and the lyrics, and he's talking to him, and he's like, "Yeah, I thought if if it was going to be a song we were going to do, and you were going to sing it, it'd have to be about snakes and fire and stuff." <laughs> <laughs> and I I always got a kick out of that line because yeah, that's tortured artist yeah. subjects. They, 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 they knew for three, I'm not going to call them regular guys, but for three guys who were very much about the business and music, they knew that they needed somebody kind of wild on stage. Well, they certainly got that. They got it. That. No, he's, he's, like I said, I think of this 27 Club thing, and he's like immediately the first person that pops into my mind. And just imagine, I mean, you look at pictures of him, like here. Yeah. Like he does not look like a 27-year-old man. He looks like a 45-year-old yeah. man with the beard and the long hair. He and, looks like somebody who's in the band. Yeah, <laughs> he does. He does. <laughs> and I guess when he was went to Paris, he had shaved his beard, lost a bunch of weight. Oh, really? And oh, uh, he was just taking these long walks in uh, in Paris. And uh, he uh, he telephoned Dinsmore to ask him how L.A. Woman was doing commercially. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was the last the band had ever spoke with him. Hmm. And was was it a heroin overdose? Uh, he well, he was found dead in the bathtub at 6 a.m. And he was 27 year old. And the. It could be natural causes because mm. of heart failure, mm-hmm. but there were a lot of things that probably added that added to the heart failure. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, this like like we said at the beginning of the show, this is a celebration of of the work and the music of these folks, 
not a celebration of their death. Yeah, and it, it gets even more interesting because under French law, no autopsy was required. Mm-hmm. So they listed heart failure. So it could have been anything, but that's what it's listed on his death certificate. Hmm. Interesting. And his uh, his grave plot in uh, Paris, oh my, that thing gets tons of graffiti, pictures. It's just one of those legendary things that if somebody goes to Paris, they got to see. Yeah, kind of like the Hendrix yeah. grave site too. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Man, I'm going to have to listen to this when I get home. All right, man, who's your next... Uh, so next on, well, we don't want to call it the hit parade. I don't know what we want to call it. <laughs> next on the celebratory list. How about that? Celebratory list. Yeah, I like it. Real easy to say. So more J Club, mm-hmm. Jimi Hendrix. Um, and this is a, a collection that I got when I was at the record store, Kiss the Sky. And there's just, there's some live cuts and some other outtakes, but it, it was just one of those things that I think I got it because I we had it as an in-store copy. And uh, they're like, anybody want that? Yeah, I do. That's so cool. I have never, uh, I have never seen this. And it's not one of those that pops. Uh, I don't even know that's been reissued. Yeah, I, I've never seen it. But if this you, has got such good could, songs you could on it. You get your T-shirt. Oh, nice. Your Hendrix T-shirt. Yeah. Are you experienced? Uh, Voodoo Child. Castles Made of Sand. Uh, Red House. Crosstown Traffic. Third Stone from the Sun. All Along the Watchtower. Damn, what a great collection. Yeah, it's man. a good collection. And uh, Jimmy departed on September 8th, 1970. And maybe he, we should still be talking about uh, the doors and riders on the storm. Yeah. <laughs> we hear a storm rolling in and uh, he began playing guitar in, at age 15, which I don't know if that's late. I don't know if it's early, but for somebody who became such a legendary guitarist as him, you know, to only play good really from starting until death, 12 years. Yeah. That is insane. That is really crazy. I mean, if he'd lived to be 60 or 70, starting at 15 wouldn't have been, wouldn't have seemed like such a big deal. But considering he only lived 12 years after that. Yeah. That's, that's kind of nutty. And Jimmy, uh, (laughs) I didn't, I didn't really know this, but he enlisted in the U.S. Army, Mm -hmm. but was discharged the following year. Yeah. In 61. Yep. Such a, uh, I mean, he's he's one, and and really, Janice, Jim, and Jimmy, their legends just seem to grow as time goes. Yeah, you know, um, he, the Hendrix family does a really good job. It kind of the guy at the helm of that has has done a really good job, not just releasing any old thing that he can, but almost every record store day. Now there's a Hendrix release, at least one of the two every year, there's a Hendrix release and whether it's a live show or something really kind of bolstering that, that catalog and that output. Because when you think about it, I mean, Jimmy was famous for what? two and a half, three years, really? I mean, he became, he kind of became famous in London before he did here. Yeah. But he, his flame burned very brightly for a very, very short time. Yeah. So there wasn't, that. there's just not that catalog, kind of like Janice. Yeah, and he, he went back to, uh, he went back to London in September of 70, and uh, his, the his last days and his death are kind of disputed. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not. And he's another tortured artist. Drugs and alcohol had a lot to do with his with his life and yeah. a lot of abuse. 
Yeah. We haven't really talked about Jimmy that much, but think about this too. You're talking about a rock star like nobody has ever seen a guitar player who the best guitar players in in England were just over the moon about right yeah and he was black yeah that on top of everything else to like we were like we were talking about earlier i mean all of the tumult and turmoil going on in the world at that time in the u.s the civil rights movement uh churning on and on right at the same time that this guy just pops out of out of almost what seems like obscurity and blows everybody's minds with his ability on the guitar crazy yeah really just crazy and he's straightforward rock and roll yeah well, I mean, there is there is a lot of blues in there. And even jazz fusion. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's just all over the place. But I think at the time, it, it Jimmy, you know, for someone who was born after he died, it, it almost seemed like Jimmy took everything in and was able to, you know, release it in a very creative way that nobody else had before. Yeah, and it would have been... It would have been great to see what this guy would do. Yeah. In in the rest of the seventies, because yeah. he was, I mean, his output, although small, was very influential. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, when you take a, a Bob Dylan song and it becomes an anthem of the late 60s of the generation yeah. of, of that generation you're you're doing something yeah there. you're doing something i mean it that song when i think of you know vietnam or you know the late 60s i always think of all along the watchtower yeah that's definitely uh and we've talked about doing a show about songs that define a decade that song kind of is one of the songs that defines that decade yeah for sure it just such an amazing artist such a kind of mysterious artist these him jim and janice all three kind of live in a in a mystery in a shroud of mystery sort of the coroner kind of ruled his death as he choked on his own vomit yeah much like keith moon I think Keith, I think uh, John Bonham. Yeah. And uh, Bon Scott. Yeah. You know, we talk about Nirvana occasionally on the show, but probably not as much as we should. They broke all right because they, they broke, you know, with Nevermind, but then they broke the entire musical system. Uh, I have always loved this unplugged performance. Um Another one who we won't talk about today, another unplugged performance, Stone Temple Pilots. Yeah. Those two are just, well, all the grunge bands, even Soundgarden's unplugged. Yeah. yeah. I mean. Pearl Jam had one too. And Pearl Jam. Mm-hmm. But they just, to hear those bands stripped down. Yeah. It was a different sound. Yeah. Well, with, I mean, with Pearl Jam, you know, Versus was kind of, yeah. you know, a great deal of that album was kind of unplugged was kind of stripped down more acoustic so that was another side of them that they shared with an album but until these guys did this nirvana was you know was grunge was that hard heavy rock sound and it's just such a great collection and you know um the man who sold the world the David Bowie cover on here is so great. It's almost like, you know, warts and all. Yeah. Kind of a performance. And um, when we have Dave Grohl on the show, we can ask. We him can that. ask him. Yeah. yeah, for sure. What more could somebody like this have had to offer if he could have gotten that help? Now it's more acceptable to to talk about those things and, and to say, hey, you know, there are people who need this that can benefit from this. But R.I.P. Kurt, we uh, we only got a little taste, but boy, how 
how delicious yeah, and that was, was that? That was going to be mine. Also, Nirvana. This is a the Black Album, mm-hmm. a collection, and I love this like smoke uh, vinyl. Yeah, you haven't opened it. yet. I haven't even opened it yet. It's uh, and I think I've the, seen it. It's the very standout cool. on this was uh, what was it? Uh, probably. Well, it's it's a greatest hits, but I th- I thought there was a previously unreleased track. Maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe. Oh, the man who sold the world is on here. Yeah. Um, heart shaped box. I was gonna talk about. I was gonna bring in Utero because that's like, for me, that's that's the Nirvana album. But yeah. I've talked so much about it. I wanted to bring Unplugged. They have a couple of live albums that are really really great too. Um, there it when you listen to their live stuff, it's like, you know, Dave Grohl is such a great drummer, such a groove. He's, he's one of those drummers that when you hear, you're like, Oh, that's Dave Grohl. Just like John Bonham. And yeah, you know, a lot of people, uh, Chris Novacelli, great bass player. But you know, with those two fantastic musicians, you had Kurt playing guitar and singing and it, all of their live stuff to me sounds like they're just on the verge of like, losing control yeah and and you can't you can't intend to do that you can't say we're gonna sound like that you either do or you don't and they definitely did yeah and for a band that kind of started out as a trio and then by unplugged uh pat smear Mm -hmm. was pretty much a default facto member of the band yeah yeah, there were different points in their history where they had four members, where they had another guitarist. But, you know, when they became famous, they were a trio. And I love Pat Smear, too. I mean, yeah. he's from the Germs. Yes. Another legendary, like, punk, post-punk band. And, uh, yeah, they're, they're just a great band. And, obviously, out of the, out of the uh, ashes of Nirvana came Foo Fighters. And they've, they've become the one another one of the biggest bands in the world yeah they know. really are dave grohl is the the mayor of rock and roll <laughs> yeah, as the I mayor say. Of rock and <laughs> so who's your next another member of the j club uh, brian jones brian jones and this was ooh, there's thunder and lightning that's okay i love so it so that's that's it's, the it, intro it's staying in the yeah <laughs> it's brian jones from from the grave is is making his yeah. presence known Brian Jones, and this was his final album with the band, Let It Bleed. This is a good, when you're with such a big band, that's a that's a good one to go out on. Good swan song. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we recently did our Stones uh, show, and there was, you know, for all of the troubles that, that Brian had, and if you, you know, you read... I, I just read some stuff from Pete Townsend the other day. Say he and Brian Jones were like pretty close. And he he was talking about how kind of like what I was saying, nobody was there to help him. I mean, he he really got lost in, in the drugs and the alcohol. And at that time, it was kind of a hands-off approach. And, you know, I think the band wanted him out yeah and he was really he was not when he in uh july 3rd of 69 when he was when he died he was no longer in the band yeah which is also a shame because he's one of the founding yeah members but he the the drugs and alcohol had become such a problem that he could barely even function yeah and it's um you know, there there are demarcations in the history of bands that are there. And it, then who came in after Brian? Uh, it, Mick Jones. Mick Jones. It, well, he would really replaced Brian. Right. And Mick Jones was pretty young. He was, I think, 20. Yeah. When he replaced Brian. And then Mick was in the band for two or three albums. Yeah. And then Ronnie yeah. came in all great musicians yeah but you know brian to me brian kind of brought that um element of chaos he also was a great harmonica player a great guitarist um you know he he just had that it factor 
he you know from what i've read he was very popular with the girls and you know just kind of the rock star of the band yeah and his his departure is kind of rock starish because he was found motionless in a, the bottom of his pool yeah by a girlfriend you know the, the one throughput here is girlfriends for a lot of the males <laughs> <laughs> that they're always finding the body. Yeah. To be a person that finds that person, I would not wish that upon my worst Anyone. enemy. That's terrible. The coroner's report stated it was drowning, later clarified as death by misadventure. And and this is another death that is not really, I mean, there have been tons of rumors. Mm -hmm. It's there's still some weird, uh, weird stuff around his death. How did he get in the pool? Did he just? There always are. Yeah. There are always weird uh, things that happen in in those instances. I mean, you know, the Sam Cooke death, his death. I mean, there there's a bunch of them. Yeah, but I mean. Being in a, a swimming pool is not where you want to be when you're under the influence of <laughs> no, a lot of stuff. No, not at all. R.I.P. Brian Jones. The stones go on without you, but they're never the same. Very astute observation, Thank my you. good men. Thank you. Not a member of the 27 Club. Allison Chains, they, they are a, a Seattle band. They're grunge-era band, but they're the one... Seattle band that is you can't pinpoint them and they don't ever sound the same on any album this was kind of the world's introduction to Alice in Chains and Lane Staley this is dirt Lane was born August 27 1967 and died April 5th 2002 he was 34 and um, all you have to do is listen to a couple of their songs to know uh, just a, a voice like nobody else just and combined with Jerry Cantrell kind of singing harmony with him just nothing else like that on the radio so when you hear them you know it's them yeah and I this is really the first one that I dug into and and I love this record oh it's uh, phenomenal be beginning to end this is a great one this is the reissue from last year uh, as a, I also have an MOV issue yeah. that you have that's warped, right? Yeah. Yeah. But the, this is just a fantastic album. And, you know, they, they, the whole Seattle thing, like we talked about earlier, is just that there are not a lot of happy endings <laughs> with them. No. And I mean, there, there's a lot, and heroin is a big throughput with that i mean unfortunately it was just the the medicine of choice for these yeah a lot of these bands in that era yeah and i mean it's not surprising that you know the scene uh that a lot of the the same members wind up departing this world because of a heroin overdose or depression because that is what was going on in all those bands. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, you know, that I, I don't know what else to say about Alice in Chains. I mean, they, they had facelift, sap, um, jar of flies, dirt, and then their self-titled album and then unplugged and then Lane died. Yeah. Um, they've gone on with William Duvall as the lead singer and he is fantastic he's got a great voice it blends really well with jerry's they honor the lane stuff really well and their new stuff is great too um they were one of those bands that when that first when i think it was black gives away to blue in 20 I, I don't know 2009 or 10 when that came out i was very surprised because there had been some years there and they hadn't done anything. And I was like, wow, uh, that's not a band I would have expected to, to come back. And, and I really do like all of their newer 
stuff too. It's it's just it's the same band, but it's a different band. Yeah, it, it's that. I think that's a good way to put it. It's the same band, but it's different. And the hype sticker here is Square, which is approved. Approved. What's your next one? <clears throat> well, my next one will actually be my last one because we had some sames. Yeah. So Amy Winehouse, Amy, born September 14th, 1983, departed July 23rd, 2011. And she was that tortured soul. I mean, she even had a song Rehab, Mm -hmm. which is pretty much sets the record (laughs) like you don't have to send me to rehab but yeah amy amy was definitely that tortured musician that self-medicated a lot Mm -hmm. and this is is this your favorite of hers uh yeah i like back to black quite a bit i love it they've got the lyrics on on the back too it's very cool I guess there's a new, is there a new movie coming out yeah, about yeah. her? Oh, yeah, there is. That's right. Yeah. I don't know much about that. I, I don't either. I've, it's, it's, you know, inevitably there's always going to be uh, a movie, a, por- a portrayal of these stories. Um, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see that because I, I just don't know that much about her. I, she had a, what an incredible voice. She oh, had. yeah. And, and we talk about singers, voices who made her voice made a huge impact. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, she, I, she was just, I was just not plugged in at the time that she became popular and, uh, kind of learned about her as she was twirling out of control. And music was really part of her life for a long time because she was uh, a member of the National Youth Orchestra during her youth. So No kidding. She wasn't just someone who came up through rock and roll. She was, you know, yeah. really a trained singer and musician. That's cool. It is so interesting that there's a thunderstorm uh, like there is going on right now while we're talking about these folks. Yeah. And this... this uh, Back to Black became, that's when, that really launched her career in 2006 when it came out. And then, I know on the, you know, every, it seemed like every six months there was a new Amy Winehouse story. Oh, Amy has left rehab again or Mm -hmm. entered rehab. Yeah. And it just, she never seemed to. It never stuck. Yeah, it just never never stuck she was she was just had too much going on to get it under control yeah such a shame but again like like we've said these stories are not uncommon they're they're hard to believe you know even 40 and 50 and 60 years later it's hard to believe uh you don't want to believe that the people that you look up to your heroes the people whose art you appreciate so much uh have these problems yeah you know, music's kind of an escape yeah it's, you know people listen to music to escape what's going on in their lives a lot of time and then you kind of think okay well what do the musicians that are making the music do they probably listen to music to escape too absolutely and her, her drug use had become such a problem that in 2008 uh island records toyed with the idea of releasing her and i mean this is somebody who had won a grammy Mm -hmm. and was like a number one selling artist yeah sometimes uh there is such a thing as bad press (laughs) yes there is such a thing as bad press um she and like a lot of these folks we've talked about, she struggled with mental illness and depression and uh, really substance abuse was her way of coping. Coping. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, she is a more contemporary member of the 27 Club. 
for sure. Her bodyguard went to her uh, residence three days before her death and felt she had been somewhat intoxicated, and he observed her drinking over the next few days. But he said she'd been laughing and listening to music and watching TV and didn't think anything about it. Mm. And, uh, you know, a lot like Brian Jones' death, her, uh, the coroner came back with a verdict of a misadventure. <laughs> what is mis- <laughs> misadventure? It sounds like an adventure I don't want to go on. <laughs> yeah. If you want to go on an adventure, don't go on a misadventure. <laughs> Her, her blood alcohol content was uh, 0.416. Mm. 0.416. 40%. Yeah. Yikes. That's, <laughs> I've never ever heard of that. Yeah. I've probably been there before. <laughs> Luckily, I'm alive to talk yeah. about it. Oh. Uh, yeah. R.I.P. Amy. You know, some of these stories are, you know, borderline pathetic and, you know, uh, it's always I always have a soft spot in my heart for these types of stories whether I'm a fan of the person or not because um, I don't know what it's like to struggle through that yeah. type of a thing but you know being a huge fan of music um, y- it's just history repeating itself over and over you know yeah it really is and I've always said that if I were a famous musician, rock star, what have you, I, I think I would take a bunch of that money and have somebody, like not, maybe not a bodyguard, maybe a doctor or a nurse that is, you know, if I have medications to take, that is distributing the med- medications. It, it's easy to make this a sensible thing, but these are ridiculous situations that these people are, are hurled into. These yeah. are opportunities for you know with money to have relationships with people drugs that you never would have access to otherwise i mean it's you know it's an outstanding um situation it's it's a ridiculous situation and you can't uh imprint sense on a ridiculous situation but you know you can only hope that moving forward there are fewer stories like this because uh you know it, it it's a good show to get that the word out and to talk about these folks and give and honor them but it's not necessarily a fun thing no. to think about and consider but um we we wanted to talk about these folks um from a respectful respectful point of view and and honor their legacies and and their catalogs and and what they've given to all of us who you know have the sickness uh, I just wanted to point out a couple more. Del Shannon, born in 1934, passed away in 1990. So he was 55. A uh, huge early rock star as a guitarist and a songwriter. And I think at the time that he died, he was working with Tom Petty on uh, on kind of a comeback album. I think he'd done oh. one or two. But Tom Petty was a huge Del Shannon fan. Um, yeah, but he he took his own life in 1990. R.I.P. Dell. Uh, I love uh, listening to his. I got. I don't. I don't know when I got this. this is a look at that. That's a Rhino press. Ooh, that's an old Rhino. An old Rhino press. And uh, so you got Runaway. Hats off to Larry. So long, baby. Cry myself to sleep. Do you want to dance? Keep searching, stranger in town. You don't realize how many songs Dell did yeah. until you start hearing them. Yeah, yeah. He he listed. was great. He was a great one. Chris Bell was another member of uh, the Twenty Seven Club, a member of Big Star with uh, Alex Chilton, and uh, Chris was another one of those artists that succumb to the demons yeah just you know i uh, i had seen this in a couple of articles that i had read and and this is a a pretty big album you know um they certainly aren't an everyday band that everybody knows about they're a very influential band for uh, a lot of 
alternative rock acts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we wanted to mention him. He's another one. You know, there's there's so many. You got Steve Clark from Def Leppard, the second guitarist. He was born April 23rd, 1960 and died January 8th, 1991. So he was 30. Um, he was credited with really kind of making Def Leppard sound so distinctive, that guitar uh, tone. Uh, Phil Collin, obviously, part of that too. But when, when they lost Steve, Vivian Campbell, who had played for Ronnie James Dio, uh, became a full-time member of the band and, you know, playing in his stead. I got to meet Vivian a few years ago in Las Vegas. Very nice guy. So... R.I.P. Steve Clark. You also have Cliff Burton, original bassist for Metallica. He he was not in the, thank you, he was not in the 27 Club, but he was born February 10, 1962, and died September 27th, 1986, at just 24. And he was kind of like that backbone, that uh, that guy that really brought all of the musical pieces of Metallica together. And this is a blackened records press of this. This isn't a Walmart press. I do have a Walmart press too, but Kill 'Em All, just such a huge, huge album and kind of a statement at the same time being sort of the poster boys for thrash metal. I mean, now you listen to this and it just sounds like hard rock. Yeah, heavy, heavy yeah rock. it really is. Uh, there are definitely some bands that are thrash. But Metallica would not be what they are without Cliff. Yeah. So, you know, if if we could go on and on and on, we kind of have. But, um, you know, there's so many people who who never reached what we would think of as their full potential as artists. And, uh, you know, it's but then again, that short amount of time that they were around, they made such a huge impact that that's. That's what we want to honor and and uh, share with with everybody is just these folks live on in their music, in their legacy, in their catalog, in the history books, and some sometimes in in movies. We want to thank everybody for coming along and listening to these shows and watching our YouTube channel. Jacob has been hard at work creating all of these little video morsels that we have on on the youtube channel uh our shorts uh putting the shows together our unboxings all of that and you can find all of that on the vinyl ventures youtube channel we want to remind you guys when you're there we want you to share what you see we want you to make comments about what you like even what you don't like but we also want you to share it with people and comment with us and tell us what you want to see on the show um, what else do we want folks to do? Ideas subscribe. for shows? Well, oh, yes. Subscribe to that YouTube channel. Uh, join us on our social media on Instagram and Facebook. We want you guys to do a lot of things. And we'll keep bringing the, uh, we'll keep bringing the vinyl and we'll keep spinning for you guys if you do that. So, Four Wheels, I'm Jay, and we'll see you all the next time around. It's a-